Well, good morning. It's been a while, but sometimes, in fact, all the time, <laughs> when you are serving God in his kingdom, it is very necessary to sit back and make sure that you are taking the proper instructions from him. So anyway, here goes for today. This is Prophetess Debs coming to you from 7750. Today is the 17th of October, 2023, and it is the second day of the eighth month of Cheshvan on the Hebrew calendar, 5784. Yesterday was the 16th of October. That means 16, 8 plus 8, Oct, eight again, triple eight. That is the signature of Jesus Christ. His name is written with that value, triple eight in Greek. Yesterday, there was a massive hailstorm outside. I watched it from my window and it went on for a while. And then after that, I went to take a nap. I had some dreams during that nap, but when I woke up, I couldn't remember them. But then, you know, the Lord was like, you know, in two course, you remember, for now, carry on with your work. So I was like, okay, Lord, what must I do next? He said, do more research on the unraveling of Prince Andrew, the Duke of York. And I thought, what more can I possibly, what more research can I possibly do on him that I haven't done already? But you know, God is always on time. I forgot that in my extensive digital library, I have a book and I want to get the proper title of the book. The book is titled Courtiers. The Hidden Power Behind the Crown, and it's by Valentine Lowe. I don't even remember when I ever bought this book, but here it is. And it, you know, when, when you are serving God, there's nothing that is difficult. You don't have to go through reams and reams of pages of books. He'll just tell you somehow, and it's easier with the digital books because he'll give you let's say a word or a phrase that you can search. And when I searched, I went directly to chapter 11 of the book. And chapter 11, now, and you must remember something, the number 11 is symbolic of disorder, chaos, disintegration. That is also why when Joseph had been removed from his family and had been taken as a slave to Egypt, his family was in disarray. They, 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 were, in, they were in dis disintegration because there were only 11 of them at that stage and he was in Egypt. So here is chapter 11 and it is titled, They are all being nasty to me. This entire chapter, I'm not actually even going to go into it, is about Prince Andrew and just the horrendous and grotesque character that he is. I want to read this particular extract here. It says, he was without question the most arrogant and thoughtless public figure I have ever interviewed. That's just the opinion of one person, but these are the people who are inside the royal court. They see him every day, they interact with him and various other people in the royal court. He is described somewhere in the midst of these interviews as talking absolute crap and revealing himself to be incompetent, useless, ill-prepared and thoughtless. Mind you, the man thinks that he's, he's all that because after all, he's the prince, he's the duke, and he's the queen's favorite son. There's an incident here 
where he is described as going up to somebody, one of the courtiers that was working with the king, with the queen, with the queen. And it is said that Prince Andrew stole up to them, pointed a finger in Roscoe's face and said, who the F are you to ask this man for an effing umbrella? You go find your own effing umbrella. And this is just his language that he employs um, whenever he feels like it. And then he went running after this incident, he went running to the queen to give his version of the story. So that by the time, or if it happened that this particular courtier would report to the queen what he had done, in a sense, she, she already has in, in her own head a version that he has put to her. And then when this person comes now to tell his side of the story, he's already been discredited. In a different incident, it says here, this was not the only time Andrew was stunningly rude. On one occasion, somebody was trying to get him to do something. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But when they tentatively broached the, the issue to him, his response, his immediate response was immediate and spectacular. He told them to F off out of his office and to F off out of his life. And it says he was undoubtedly difficult to deal with and could be grotesquely unpleasant. And so now I was now understanding that God was saying to me, welcome to my world. Because I've never seen this before. But voila, here it is. Now, Prince Andrew um, gets then into his very deep problems now with the Virginia, the Virginia Andrews Jufra story, where he is now being charged for under age sex with a 17-year-old girl. She's no longer a 17-year-old girl, mind you. Now she's a fully-fledged woman, and she has been waiting for justice for a very long time. And there's negotiations going on about him doing the disastrous interview that led to his downfall. But somewhere in the midst of all of that, he takes his daughter to the meeting. He takes Princess Beatrice. You know, to a narcissist. A narcissist loves nobody but themselves. And so even their own children are just for nothing except their own glory. When it looks good and it makes them look good, you know, put the children on display. And meanwhile, you don't really know what happens in private when the person has to be face to face with his children and be a father. But anyway, so I read all of this with intrigue and I'm like, wow, God really is a mastermind. In the end, it was Prince Andrew's very own right hand woman, his PR manager or whatever she calls herself, that threw him under the bus. Because when God has been working on something for a long time, the very people that you thought were your gods, you trusted them, they will give you advice that in the end will lead to your un very unraveling. And that, those are the people that took Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, disgraced as he is now, <laughs> to the ultimate downfall. It says here, this woman idolized him. She could not see any of his faults. She had a complete blind spot. And so these are the circumstances that led Prince Andrew to his downfall. And so then it describes here, then came round to Virginia Jufra's allegation that she'd had sex with Andrew, which surfaced in January 2015, and everything was back to square one. Andrew's reputation was stretched once more. 
Of course, for a long time, it looked like this poor girl was never going to get any justice. But Epstein then went to jail. And I'm not going to go into any of that. There was a documentary that was done, The Prince and the Pedophile. And so Prince Andrew got his daughter to participate in the negotiations for the very interview, Newsnight interview, that was his ultimate unraveling. Emily Maitlis, the lady who did the interview for Newsnight, describes how the Duke even thought that he'd done so well at his interview. <laughs> that afterwards, he, he looked very pleased with himself. He couldn't see. He's the only one who couldn't see how embarrassingly foolish he looked. So anyway, when I finished my research in this book, the Lord then said to me, go back to the other one. The other one being Sex, Lies and Dirty Money by Ian Halperin. There's just one extract I'm going to read out of this one where Jeffrey Epstein is talking to Ian, the writer of the book, and he describes his relationship with Prince Andrew. And this is in the book, says Jeffrey Epstein. We'd spend hours listening to all shows, he claimed. Prince Andrew loved Howard's humor. The only bigger pervert who I ever met other than Howard was Andrew. He was obsessed with, he says a very nasty word here, I'll just say apparently he was obsessed with the female private parts. And he says, I don't recall, I don't think I can recall having a conversation with Andrew when he didn't go off about hot private parts of women. This is his friend, Jeffrey Epstein, describing his own friend, and this record has remained long after Jeffrey Epstein has left. So then I said, okay, Lord, I've done that. Where is this going? And God said, carry on doing research. Now, before I carry on, please understand something. I wasn't just talking about that hailstorm for fun. A hailstorm in biblical terms and spiritual terms is about judgment. When a hailstorm comes, it will leave, it will leave, it is a sign of God's wrath. It leaves damage in its path. If you're a farmer or you've got plants or whatever, you know, it, it will leave a trail of destruction in its path. In certain places, it's a flood, it leaves all kinds of damage. So that is what the storm is, is about. So I actually even wrote here, hmm, so Prince Andrew is a compulsive pathological liar and his children are used as alibis and they're just used for PR purposes. Then the Holy Spirit led me to the name of a wife killer named Andrew Hunter. This Andrew Hunter is described as a cold-blooded assassin. A narcissist is all about his image. Nothing is more important about his ego and his image. From that I was led to another one, a controlling wife killer by the name of Andrew Monroe who was jailed for life. I thought, oh, okay. Interesting. Another convicted wife killer came up. His name is Andrew Kobe. And then I saw another description of this Andrew Hunter. He is described as a man of exceptional depravity. But oh no, that wasn't enough. God said, just keep searching. I'll show you some things. And indeed he did. Because then I came across a person called Killer Keith Hunter Jesperson. This Killer Keith Hunter Jesperson was born on the 6th of April, 1955. He's a Canadian American serial killer who murdered women and he was known as the Happy Face Killer. So he's currently 68 years old and 
he killed his victims by strangulation. So I thought, oh, okay. Hmm. Brothers in arms with Andrew Hunter, the wife assassin. How intriguing, I thought. And then I thought, okay, Lord, I've done all of that. Where to from here? He said, now go back to the, the book by E.M. Halperin and I'll show you what to look for. And I opened the book again and I want to actually read the accurate description. This is what Jeffrey Epstein said about Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew, Prince Andrew's my closest friend in the world, he said. I call him A. Miles Andy because of his penchant for traveling. He's a true jet set. Some of the best times of my life have been in his company. We are very similar. We are both serial sex addicts. He's the only person I have met who is more obsessed with the female private body parts than me, he says. We have shared the same women. From the reports I've got back from them, he's the most perverted animal in the bedroom. He likes to engage in stuff that's even kinky to me, and I'm the king of kink. This is Jeffrey Epstein describing his best friend, Prince Andrew. <laughs> so I look at all this and I'm like, oh, wow. Now, let me go back to the scripture in 1 Corinthians 5.5 5, in the voice. It says, and I was, I had started in the previous episodes talking about a man of incest. And the Apostle Paul said to the church in Corinth, I direct you to release this man over to Satan so his rebellious nature will be destroyed and his spirit might be rescued in the day the Lord Jesus returns. Your proud boasting in this matter is terrible. Don't you understand that the tiniest infraction can bring about an unwelcome chain of events that just a little yeast causes all the dough to rise? And this is exactly what I spoke about when I first began these videos. I said one man, one man will bring about the fall of many. And this is exactly what the, 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 the Apostle Paul says here. Saying, oh, you've been applauding your champion, this man of incest, in the public assembly. How tragic that you can't actually see that in applauding this man, you are welcoming the unwelcome chain of events. God will never start something and then leave it hanging and leave it in the middle. He means just what he says. And so, though it looked like nothing was happening to Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, eventually his royal life came to a grinding halt. Just like that. And I actually, I actually want to go into the description of how it happened with him because it was very much a political or a politically motivated stop to his career. Ah, there we go. It says here, in February of 2011, a photograph was published in the News of the World showing Prince Andrew walking in New York Central Park with Jeffrey Epstein. Two years after the disgraced financier had pleaded guilty to child sex charges, there was a clamor for Andrew to step down from his role as special trade envoy. Nothing happened for months. Then in July, when everyone was on holiday, Andrew was canoeing in Canada with his daughters. The government said he was stepping down as trade envoy. The line that was put out was that it was all his decision, but it wasn't. Downing Street made the decision. With the collusion of Christopher Gate, the Queen's, the Queen's private secretary, then still in his role, 
Neither Andrew nor his private secretary knew anything about it until it was too late. It was an ambush, said one source. The Duke felt very hard done by it. He believed that he'd been betrayed by Gates and never forgave him. So that's how it went down. It went down through Downing Street, 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister's, the Prime Minister's residence in London, and through uh, those court, well, that one courtier that was, was clearly very powerful. And even Prince Andrew himself, the Duke of York, arrogant as he was, couldn't do anything about it. His feeling betrayed didn't stop the train from moving. The train carried on moving. And why is that story so important at this time? It's because there's the same script, different cast that's going to play out even if it's not exactly in the same detail because there's never a situation of one person that is perfectly matched to another. But if God says, same script, different cast, that's exactly what he's saying. And I've been saying, he has to absolutely explain to me why it is that I have been walking in dreams and visions with the likes of Sarah Ferguson and Princess Diana. It's because what God started, he is going to finish. It has nothing to do with me. I just have to declare his word on the situation. And it is going to play out by itself. Because I don't have to press the buttons. The stage is already set. Prince Andrew, Duke of York, chose the stage. And God allowed him to choose the stage. It was a very global stage. And so, in the same script, different cast, what am I going to call it? Oh, yes. 7750 has a brand that's called Family and Education. Yes, it's called Family and Education. Oh, yes, indeed. Shakespeare. Shakespeare was inspired to write all of his plays and we have been, we, we, he, he has been set. He has been a set study. In most schools, whether it's Macbeth, it's Tem The Tempest, it's The Merchant of Venice, we have been studying Shakespeare for decades, for centuries in the school curriculum. And so, I can look forward to the fact that my play or my plays are going to be in the school curriculum in the future. So what shall I call this one? Let me think. Ah, I know. I'm going to call it the Duke of Maseru. Yes, yes. I like the sound of that, the Duke of Maseru. So my play of the century, yes, it's, yes, that's what the Lord says. Yes, the play of the century is called The Duke of Maseru. Oh, I, I, I like the sound of that. I like the sound of that. Very good. Okay, so that's where we're going then. Um, it's a play about the Duke of Maseru. Oh, yes. And then I just happened to come across a headline titled The, Delu the Delusion of Jada Pinkett Smith. I'm not interested in Jada Pinkett Smith and her husband, Will Smith. I just find it very funny that apparently now Jada Pinkett Smith is telling the public in, in a memoir that her and her husband decided that they are going to live separate lives and they've been divorced for the last, I don't know how many years, since 2016. And so if that is the case, I, I don't know why they haven't gotten divorced, but you know, like I said, God knows how to just keep bringing up these same script, different casts. Because I know out there in the public where the Duke of Maseru has been telling everybody that, you know, um, he divorced me a long time ago and uh, we're no longer husband and wife. And so he is entitled to do whatever he wants, where he wants, and including take, taking his girlfriends to the royal court of the kingdom of the 
woman king and introducing them there. Why? Because God knows that's how they do things. There's absolutely no surprise there. That's how they do things. And so, and this is exactly the thing. When people have got no restraint, and even the head of a place has no discernment, these are the things that they do. Why? <laughs> because God will make them look absolutely foolish to the rest of the world. I cannot imagine how much stupidity is in allowing that to happen in a respectable royal court ruled by a king. But hey, who am I? Just a mad woman who's from a village, so what does it matter? But indeed, yeah. oh yes, how could I forget? Then I was hearing this song. There's a song, I think it's by a band called Brothers of Peace. Yes, they're called Brothers of Peace. And it's called Manyonyoba. To Nyonyoba is to sneak around. So as the song goes, it goes, how does it go? I think it goes something like, Wamanyonyoba Uzolimana, you're going to get hurt. So that this is directed at a man who likes sneaking into the houses of other men. So when men, when the men are leaving, he sneaks in and uh, it says he goes under the miniskirt. Something under the miniskirt. Yes, so, you know, he's, he's sleeping around with other people's wives under the miniskirt. And, you know, the song, it's just, you know, I've forgotten how it goes. But, you know, this, and, and it's a quite a song. It's got quite a catchy bit. Yes, the beat is quite catchy, and he keeps going on about how uh, you're, 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 you're sneaking into the houses of something when yes, what are you doing with the wives of other men? You're gonna get hurt, or you're gonna hurt yourself, something of that nature. Uh, anyway, that's how it goes. So I kept hearing that, so I was like, oh, okay, because God knows how to keep repeating His message. I don't listen to Kwaito. I've got no business with Kwaito. But I mean, I mean, you know, I don't live in a vacuum and a, and a bubble, you know. Once in a while, God will direct me to a secular song, secular music, and so that I can, I can kind of like gauge where he's going. So that's how the song goes. So there's, a, there's definitely a problem here of a man who thinks he's, he's, he, he's the sex bomb. Um, he's assisting all sorts of men in their households sleeping with their wives wonderful oh and then of course yes yes alistair crowley was very much a man who who promoted a belief in the capricornus the leaping goat of liberty he called it and that is baphomet the goat that is worshipped by satanists and he, to him, it, sim it was symbolic of the magical child produced as a result of sex magic. Wow. I, I, I had I've never seen that before, but I learned. That's what I learned. And then there is a character called Babylon, the Scarlet Woman, the mother of abominations, a goddess of the mis mystical system of Thelema. I've been talking about the religion of Thelema that Alistair Crowley was the prophet of. And he says, this woman represents the female sexual impulse and it represents the liberated woman. He calls it a spiritual office and it is filled by actual women that are the counterpart of himself in his own identity as the great beast. Oh, and then he says together, their energies manifest the Aeon of Horus. She is a sacred whore and consorts with him as the father of life, known as Chaos. Oh, and she rides astride the beast. 
Now, if you know the Bible, you can hear that Alistair Crowley has gotten these things straight out of, of Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. And he says she is a religious whore. So let's go to Revelation 17 and 18. I feel like I've been going on for too long. I don't know if the timer has stopped. So I think I'm going to end it here. Revelation 17 is about the judgment of the great prostitute and the beast. The great beast. And Revelation 18 is about the fall of Babylon. I think that's enough for today. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.